police say more than 10,000 people may have lost their lives in one area alone. Well, since the original earthquake and the tsunami at the end of last week, we've been reporting that Japan invests heavily in earthquake preparedness with very strict building regulations. A little earlier, I spoke to Professor Colin Taylor, head of earthquake engineering at the University of Bristol. He's got first-hand experience of the kind of scenes you're looking at right now. I started by asking him first why most buildings in cities like Tokyo were able to withstand the earthquake. Well, looking from the, the video pictures, and uh, I've got a colleague who's out in Tokyo at the moment, he's been sending me information back, the buildings themselves uh, seem to perform very well. The, the Japanese have the best building standards in the world from an earthquake point of view, and it looks like the latest buildings built to the latest codes of practice have done extremely well. And indeed, if you look at the uh, videos of the tsunamis coming in, the, most of the buildings are actually intact before the wave uh, hits the building. So from an earthquake point of view, the building's uh, standards and codes uh, seem to be very good. What do the buildings do? Well, they, uh, they're designed to, to flex uh, when the earthquake shakes them. And I've got a little model here which uh, illustrates uh, th this principle. Um, it's a very simple model showing three very simple buildings uh, and I'm able to move them backwards and forwards uh, as if they're in an earthquake. Uh, the buildings, when they're shaken, uh, will start to vibrate as the ground moves under them. And here I'm shaking the, the ground at quite a low frequency. And that's causing this tall building to, to flex a lot. Um, this is the sort of building that we've got in Tokyo. Uh, this kind of motion they will get in Tokyo is very slow because of the depth of soil, uh, soft soil underneath Tokyo. But you'll see these other two smaller buildings are, aren't being affected by this slow earthquake. If I speed the earthquake up a lot uh, and simulate something which would happen perhaps on a rock up, up an, on top of a mountain, then that will tend to have a higher frequency earthquake and it affects this smaller building more than it does the, uh, the, the, the taller one. And then if I put a, an earthquake through, which is somewhere in between those two, I should get the, uh, the middle building interacting. Is, the, does that the, explain? Uh, on Friday, when we were talking to various people on Skype, I mean, astonishingly, the Skype lines were up and running and we had perfect clarity on, on the pictures from them. Does that explain why people on literally the 35th floor, which I'm assuming here equates yes. to that, here, yes. not that, it's yes. that one, the yes. big one, the, the, yes. the, the taller one. Yes. They were basically saying, well, OK, fine, the building's <clears throat> moving, yes. but we feel quite safe. Yes. Okay, yes. if you're in that building, if you're on, on that red dot on the top of your yellow pole, what does it feel like? Is it like, I don't know, being on a ship or something? Yeah, it's a very slow swaying. It takes possibly two seconds for the very tall buildings to sway from one side to another. So it, it's, it is a bit like being on a ship. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be very quite disconcerting because the building's moving quite away. It could be displacing about a metre or so at the top, possibly a bit more, depending how, how tall the building is. Um, so you might have difficulty standing up, but the building is doing what it's supposed to do there. It's flexing with the earthquake and is quite happy. It, it, it'll, it'll absorb that, uh, that, that earthquake shock. So the safest place to be is in the building, not to run out of it. How does that translate into what's happened to the nuclear power plants? This time yesterday, well, just after this time yesterday, the Japanese government basically said the steel box, the containment vessel that the reactor sits in, was not compromised, which was good news. So in terms of the structure of the power plants, how does that model graft onto those? Well, the, the power plants, the structural engineering of the, the main building of the power plants is uh, 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 very heavily done. It's, it's, they're, they're very robust, they're very stiff, so they tend to move with the ground. And uh, certainly from the pictures I've been seeing, I can't see any significant damage to the main structure itself. And the reactor is within a very thick, heavy steel containment vessel, which will be very rigid and sturdy. Uh, it's designed for in internal expansion and explosions, really. So from, a, from an earthquake point of view, it should be very secure. And nothing I've seen uh, so far would suggest that that's, that's not the case. Professor Colin Taylor. And well, as the scale of the devastation caused by Friday's earthquake and tsunami becomes clearer, the Japanese authorities say 10,000 people may have lost their lives in one of the worst affected areas. Rescue workers have found scenes of total devastation in isolated coastal towns northeast of the main city of Sendai, which was itself partially destroyed by the waves. Tsunami warnings are still being issued as powerful aftershocks continue to rattle the coastline. 
and millions remain without electricity and authorities are stepping up relief efforts as the scale of the tragedy becomes clearer. We're joined now by our correspondent Clive Myrie. He's just on the outskirts of Sendai City. Uh, Clive, uh, clearly we can see the devastation behind you. What, what have you encountered since you've been there? It's quite amazing to actually be in this area. We are something like a quarter of a mile or so from the coastal plain, which is the uh, area where the earthquake just off the coast hit the epicenter of the earthquake. And then, of course, that created this huge 30-foot high tidal wave that rammed the coastal plain at around 60 miles an hour, brought all that seawater in at least quarter of a mile to my position here around me. You can see what that water damage has done. It's picked up vehicles, cars, trucks, lorries at this uh, dealership here, picked them up, tossed them around as if they were just toy cars. Um, more devastation further behind me here, more vehicles piled up. And over to my right, you probably won't be able to make this out, there is a huge plume of black smoke rising up from the distance. That is one of the fires created as a result of the tremor from the earthquake. Uh, a lot of fires were put out, but that one still seems to be billowing out a lot of black, acrid smoke. And I've been talking to some of the people here on the ground. One man said he hasn't seen anything like this. There is a shortage of food, a shortage of water in some of the uh, coastal areas around here. And uh, some areas do have a problem with le electricity as well. The army has been mobilized to the tune of around 100,000 troops to try and deal with the situation running along the, east, the uh, eastern seaboard here. But this is a massive relief operation uh, and one that is going to take a lot of time to help clear up. And since you've been there, have you seen a, a visible presence of those relief workers actually there on the ground? Are they doing what they need to? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, every now and again, we do hear and see military helicopters flying above, assessing the situation on the ground. Obviously, from the air, that's probably one of the best ways you're going to get a sense of what is going on here. And remember that a lot of these areas are still cut off. Uh, it's difficult to get to. Uh, so the air is the best way to try and drop in supplies, trying to reach those people who uh, need some kind of help. Something like a quarter of a million people uh, have left their homes. They're in rescue shelters uh, and uh, makeshift shelters along the eastern seaboard here. Uh, it's a massive relief, op relief operation, uh, and a number of countries uh, have offered help. And that relief operation is being coordinated by the UN. But all around me, every now and again, emergency vehicles are hurt to and fro into to, further towards the coastal plain there to see what they can do. Clive Murray, just outside Sendai City, thank you very much. Well, as we've been hearing, many small communities along the northeastern coast of Japan remain cut off. Nick Ravenscroft is in Sendai. Uh, the problem at the moment is that the road networks are very seriously compromised by the effects of the tsunami and also by the effects of the earthquake itself. Now, just getting normal deliveries of food into shops in areas which have not been affected by the tsunami has proven to be difficult enough. So we've got shortages uh, for miles around this area which was affected by the earthquake. But in terms of getting people into those areas where Alistair is, uh, those more remote communities which are cut off, that's a big problem. And today we have seen large helicopters, Chinook helicopters, ferrying supplies, presumably supplies, back and forth up and down this coastline to try and reach those communities. But it's a massive job. We're talking about 100,000 military personnel who've already been committed to this. And on top of that, we have rescue teams from other parts of the world who are even now arriving here in Japan. One aspect to this, Nick, has been the level of preparedness. I mean, are we talking about people literally who have stockpiles of food and supplies in their houses just in case something like this has happened? Well, I suppose it's possible that there are people who have taken those precautions. I've seen people buying food, some of them uh, walking away from shops with two or three well-stuffed carrier bags. So it was clear that they hadn't just popped out to get a snack for their evening meal. These are people who are getting in supplies just in case uh, there is no replenishment. But it's, of course, a vicious circle. The more people go out to buy these things, uh, the more they stock up and the less there is available for everyone else and the more acute those shortages are. Uh, my gut feeling, and it's just a gut feeling, is that things may start to get 
uh, something towards uh, towards something approaching normality in many areas of uh, Japan, uh, the northern areas of uh, of the country, uh, which are not directly affected by the tsunami uh, in the first few days of this week. However, it may well be the case that actually the transport problems are enduring ones that can't easily be fixed, and we will see ongoing shortages not just in those remote cut-off communities, but in other places which have not seen this inundation with the tsunami waves. Nick Ravenscroft, quite close to uh, Sendai there in Japan. Now its hospital stood defiant against the raging tsunami, but the small port town of Minami Sanriku has all but been wiped from the map. More than half of its 17,500 population is unaccounted for, feared dead. From there, Alistair Leithhead reports. From the air, it just looked unreal. But close up, the true impact the wave had here on homes, shops, whole neighborhoods is overwhelming. For mile after mile, the tsunami flattened everything, throwing cars aside, pulverizing houses, and dragging the debris far inland. 10,000 people are still unaccounted for here. More than half the town is missing. This family did make it out in time. They came back today and were shocked by the damage. I was in the car with my daughter when everything began to shake violently, she told me. We rushed back to the house, grabbed a few bags. They then drove up and out of town just before the tsunami struck. This is just one small cove, one tiny inlet that we've been able to get to along this vast length of coastline that was struck by the tsunami. And you can get a sense of the power of the wave that surged up this area, crushing this car as if slamming it into a wall. Another one on its roof and buildings picked up and dragged by the power of the water up the valley. This is the impact in this small area alone. Imagine this many, many times over. Tonight, hundreds of those who made it to safety were sheltering in a local school sports hall. Their homes and possessions lost, nowhere to go. They both read and told more stories of lucky escapes. I watched everything. The wave came in and I saw it hit the concrete breakwater. It was just flicked aside and the water rushed inland. The houses were washed away. Japan is prepared for earthquakes and even tsunamis. Their evacuation plans no doubt saved lives. But this was just so big, so powerful and so devastating, the number of dead will just continue to rise. Alice Alithed, BBC News, Minami Sanriku Village, Japan. Well, as the people of Japan try to come to terms with the aftermath of the tsunami, the prospect of cleaning up and rebuilding livelihood seems daunting. Here's a report from Japanese broadcaster NHK. This was a place where uh, houses lined up before the tsunami. There's nothing here. It's all reduced to ruins. And on top of a three-store building, there was a bus that was washed ash ashore from tsunami. You could see the bus on the building. On top of an uh, elementary school, you can see a house that drifted. How could this place return to its original site? We really couldn't see how we really could restore the area. It cannot be helped. Well, those who survived must help each other. I lost everything in an instant. I could save my life. I'm alive, but I don't know if it's good or bad. I don't know if it's good or bad that I survived. Well, let's just show you some live pictures uh, of the scene in Iwaki. It is 7.13 in the morning there. It's a town close, well, to the south of Sendai, one of the worst affected areas that we've been talking so much about. Well, 
This is uh, the scene of the absolute devastation in uh, many parts there. There's no electricity, shops are closed and residents have just left because the food rather and fuel supplies have just run out.